I grew up in a little humble home. My, uh, my mother was a wonderful patriot. She was probably the um, most patriotic person I've ever known in my lifetime. When I was about six or seven years old, my mother used to take me to all the big parades in McKeesport. That was the nearest town. And uh, she was, as I mentioned earlier, she was a very patriotic woman. And uh, when the Marines marched by in a parade, these were all World War I and Spanish-American War veterans, and maybe Haiti. And the Marines marched by with their, with their sharp as anything, you know. It was always in my heart to be a Marine, so when I was old enough, uh, I figured, well, I'll just take off out of high school and just go to, and go to the nearest recruiting office. It was 200 miles away. It was either New York or Baltimore, Maryland. So I walked. I walked all the way to Baltimore and joined the Marines. And uh, I got there just before my 18th birthday. So they kept me there in a recruiting station for a day. I ate about maybe 27, 28 bananas, maybe three dozen for all I know. I wasn't heavy enough and had to drink a lot of water, so when the doctor checked me over and weighed me, I was just enough to make it into the Marine Corps. When I went to boot camp, I was very blessed and fortunate to have two drill instructors, and most fellows don't remember their, it's too bad, they don't remember their DIs, but I can just see my drill instructor, Corporal Ambrose D. Webb, a veteran of Haiti and Nicaragua, and uh, Sergeant John Nagazina, who was a Distinguished Service Cross winner, and uh, recipient, I should say. John Nagazina was like a grandfather, but Ambrose D. Webb was really the hard charger. Every day he had uh, a particular thing he wanted to convey to every recruit, and he'd march, walk right by, by every man with his nose about an inch away from your nose, and he'd say, you're the best fighting man on earth. You can whip anybody in the world. You can outshoot anybody in the world. Just one line. He did that every morning, all the time we were in boot camp. And the one that I remembered that I utilized many times, sometimes when the Marines asked me to talk to a group of young, young Marines, I said, I want to share a little story with you about my drill instructor. And one of the hundreds and hundreds of uh, admonitions, I used to call them, that, uh, uh, that he uh, uh, threw on us, uh, the recruits, was that uh, the first uh, one day he came to each man and he says, uh, he looked you right in the eye, steely eyes, and he says, if we ever go to war and you get captured, I'll come and find you and kill you myself. So you can imagine these 17, 18 year old kids there, their knees are just going like this and rattling. And, uh, and how many times did I think of Admiral, or Corporal Ambrose D. Webb at Guadalcanal and, and, and different battles I'd been in over the years. Every Marine that landed on Guadalcanal landed with a 1903 Springfield five-round bolt-action rifle. All my machine guns, which I had uh, really worked on in Cuba, uh, were probably the best machine guns in the Marine Corps, but they were all 1917, 1918 A1 Browning water-cooled machine guns and 1924 light machine guns. So that was what we landed with. And about this time, the greatest number of people on Guadalcanal, all vying, all fighting for this little piece of ground, little piece of ground called, called uh, Henderson Field. And uh, it, they had approximately 30,000 Japanese trying to capture this little field. And we had almost as many Marines at this time. So there probably be between, uh, I heard General Vandegrift say this, between 50 and 60,000 individuals trying to capture this little airfield. We were told that uh, the island is 90 miles long and 30 miles wide. And uh, all of these people are fighting for one thing. And General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, excuse me, Admiral Nimitz had mentioned in bulletins that he sent to the units that uh, whoever captured or owned, held Guadalcanal would also go on and take Australia and New Zealand. So it was imperative that every man understand this. He had just had to understand the fight to the death, in other words, to hold this island. So all we had was like a horseshoe from the water's edge uh, through coconut groves, through jungles, and down through ravines, and through more jungles and kunai fields, and back down the water. So if you could picture a little line in, in this 90-mile long, 30-mile wide island, 
and just a little couple miles around this airfield was, was the 1st Marine Division holding this piece of ground, holding this airport. We had what we called the uh, Coast Watchers and a fellow named Martin Clemens who's still alive and I correspond with him and even talk with him on telephone is the only one left. Now he picked up all the scouts and um, went to the hills with a shortwave radio and he would tell our people when the Japanese ships were coming down from her ball or somewhere up north and tell General Vandegrift and our, our uh, authorities that the ships were coming and where they were going to land and all these things. So he had his, in his group, uh, the chief of police was a fellow named Jacob Vuza, Sergeant Major Jacob Vuza. He and I later became very dear friends and I even visited with him after the war. But uh, they were the scouts and they reported to us that they were going to have their all-out attack. This would be the biggest attack they've ever had on, to recapture the airfield and they knew they were going to recapture it. And uh, this was October 24th, 25th, and 26th. And you could look out to sea and you never, we didn't see one American ship. All we saw was Japanese ships sailing back and forth. Battleships, cruisers, everything you can think of. Heavy cruisers, light cruisers, destroyers, every type of ship you could think of. Just, just going back and forth around Savo Island. Now Savo Island, as everybody knows, is Iron Bottom Sound. There are more uh, mil uh, naval vessels sunk there than anywhere in the world. And it's still called Iron Bottom Sound. Well, anyhow, this is the situation, if you can picture that. Now my battalion, uh, they, we had to rove around. You never knew where you were going to be. You weren't in one spot maybe two or three days and then you moved wherever you thought the scouts said that the Japanese were going to try to penetrate our lines. So every day, every morning, we had air raids every noon, every, every night, uh, they shelled from the sea and constantly the Japanese were trying to break through our lines somewhere to recapture the airfield. So as a consequence, we found ourselves at this point, October 24th, uh, right near Henderson Field. What happened is that Colonel Hannigan was the commanding officer of my battalion. Incidentally, when we landed at Guadalcanal, nobody even knew that he was, uh, he was the uh, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor for Haiti, 1921, and two Navy crosses. And then the other battalion was run uh, by uh, Chesty Puller, who became a very famous Marine. And uh, so we moved into we were told that my battalion, Hannigan's battalion, since he was the most experienced, I guess, to go west and into Japanese territory. And they'd selected by crude maps that they had, Australian maps, that they had to stop the, the regiment coming from the west. And they had, uh, Puller was assigned to position um, where we were, you see, right near the airport. And, uh, and the, uh, at the same time, the Army 164th Infantry had landed a couple thousand of those fellows. So they were there with this, this group, and they put the uh, a weapons battalion with their 37 millimeters. This was a, in those days, that was the most lovable piece of equipment because it fired thousands of little steel balls out there, and they just scattered out through the jungle, and it hit no matter what was out there, mosquitoes or anything else, it would knock them over. So they had all these right there at Henderson Field. And uh, the, the people that came across from the west, we were now, we were arrived there the night of the 24th. It was raining, artillery fire was coming in from the Japanese because their scouts said that we, we had entered their territory. And high on the hill, Mount Austin, was an observation post where the Japanese could view the entire airfield, see the whole, whole beach area and everything else and for some reason or another, uh, it was never bombed out. I don't know why it wasn't, but uh, maybe they did try to bomb it out, but I, uh, I never did see it get bombed out. I went up years later and saw that it wasn't. But anyhow, uh, the Japanese had a rough time coming across the Matanaka River, going through this dense jungle, the most difficult jungle you ever saw in your lifetime, so thick that you could hardly walk through it. And the only reason why I know this is because I went there years later and I wanted to see how those guys got to my position. So they did work their way through. And they got uh, to a point where they, 
uh, when we received, uh, I received my orders from Major Conley, who was an executive officer, Odell Conley, o Con Conley rather. And he had about 18 men, and we came to this place. Mind you, it's pitch dark. You couldn't see anything. It's raining, and artillery fire is falling all over the place. Fortunately, none of us got hit because they either went over our heads or somewhere to the right or left. And uh, he told me that I had to take my machine gun platoon, and there would be a hill. He says, you go to the left and climb up to, and when you get to the top, you uh, search it out very, as well as you can. It's pitch dark. Set up your machine guns as quick as you can, and I'll have a rifle company to your right, and I'll have a rifle company to your left, but you've got to uh, support Fox Company on the left with your machine guns. And Major Connolly told me, he says, he always called me by my first name, even though I was a platoon sergeant. He says, Mitch, look, I'm depending on you. I'm going to be down here about 150 yards with 18 men, and your platoon's going to be up on the top, probably out in front. And that's exactly what happened, because when daylight came, I was sitting way out like sitting on a diving board, and I looked around. It's the only flat place around there. No shrubbery of any kind, just flat. I don't know what had been there. Mind you, this is Japanese territory. And then in front of me, the hill went down forward, and uh, there was kunai grass down there between myself, about 80 yards of kunai grass, and that's very thick. And it was about four or five feet high, so people could crawl through there and you never see them. And then beyond that was a very dense jungle. And when I looked to my left, here was a steep cliff with jungle. When I looked to my right, there's another steep jung uh, cl cliff with uh, wooded area. So the company on my right, during the night, they, they, the only place they could go to was directly behind me, you see. And the company on my left, this was Easy Company on my right, and Fox Company on my left, which I was protecting. And uh, so as a consequence, they ended up right behind me too. And uh, lo and behold, uh, just like everybody surmised, and I just knew in my heart, and uh, I guess my blood was really pumping at that time, and uh, I was sort of eager to get this thing gone. I don't know why, I guess because I'd seen so much in China. So. Uh, during that day, I crawled out with a couple of my men and I strung a wire, oh, just about four or five feet in front of my machine guns. And, they, and, and the fellows all asked me, he says, Mitch, what are you doing? What are you putting that wire out there for? I says, never mind. Uh, I'll tell you later on. So we stretched the wire across. And I always had one of the men carry a bag of, when we were down near the airport, uh, empty sea ration cans. We put them in a fire and blackened them. So I had a little piece of wire on each one of these cans, and I tied it on my line across there. And then I had some empty cartridges, 30 caliber empty cartridges, and I put a cartridge in each can. And I said, Don't you, can't you figure this out, fellas? And they all did immediately. It's trip wire. <clears throat> I said, we're not going to start fighting until somebody hits that trip wire. And I said, I'll tell you why. Because I know how the Japanese fight, so I wanted to I was thinking of everything I ever saw in China and everything I knew about the Japanese. And um, I knew that they would attack in force, and they loved to use a bayonet, and they loved to run a bayonet through you, then shoot you. So I try to uh, teach my men all these things. And incidentally, every man in my platoon, <clears throat> whom I trained from Cuba days, every single man in my platoon could take apart and put together a water-cooled machine gun, uh, a 1903 Springfield rifle, and a 1911 .45 caliber pistol. I would take every spring bolt, everything you could think of, and scatter them around with, like a cross, like a puzzle, and scatter around until they could put it together. And by the time we landed at Guadalcanal, they could do that blindfolded. So I had all the confidence in the world in my men. I trusted them, man on my right, man on my left, whatever. Every man in my platoon, I trusted. They were only kids too, but I was the old man because I was 25 years old and been in China, so I was like the old man to these people. And now all these troops are there, you know, there are a hundred some riflemen from Fox Company behind me and a hundred some from, from Easy Company. Well, during the day at hours, uh, somebody, I turned around and there was a little slope behind me between that j jungle and where our troops from Easy Company where, where they were uh, dug in, starting to dig in. 
and somebody stood up on top of this hill with a pair of field glasses, and I screamed at him. I screamed at him. I said, get off that hill, you knucklehead. I didn't know who it was. And uh, it happened to be the company commander. So uh, he, he went back down in the, into the wooded area behind me. And within three minutes, and I knew this was going to happen, I knew that the Japanese surely had their artillery uh, registered on that open ground, but they couldn't see mine because I was sort of in a, in a little saddle, you see, in between these jungle spots. And uh, the Japanese opened up and the Easy Company just about got wiped out. I think they had 118 casualties in about two minutes. So they had to take the whole company out and they put G Company in there. So now I had G Company to my rear and I had Fox Company to my left. So as uh, sure as anything, uh, that night, night of the 25th, we could hear the, we looked down into the jungle. We could see over the kunai grass and uh, a fellow named Price, one of my Marines on the left flank, says, uh, Mitch, Mitch, there are uh, fireflies down there in the, in the jungle. I said, they're not fireflies. They're squad leaders, Japanese squad leaders, moving their troops into position with, with little lights and uh, getting ready to attack. And uh, as soon as it gets uh, real, real dark, maybe around midnight or something, who knows, but they'll probably come charging through that uh, kunai grass and right up to our position. And uh, they did exactly that. They came up, it uh, reminded me of, uh, um, I could literally smell these guys. You know, they're so sweaty from coming through that dense jungle. And they were one day behind the other regiment. And the other regiment got knocked off real quick because they had enough people to knock them off, you know, this, particularly with those uh, uh, 37 millimeter guns and then 1,600 uh, or 1,500, over 1,000 Army guys to help Puller, Puller's uh, battalion. So uh, um, as night went on, all of a sudden we, we heard, uh, you know, how they came up there, nobody was moving. But I had all my machine guns set up with uh, interlocking bands of fire like this cross. This gun would fire this way, that gun would fire that way, right across the front. And I knew we had to protect the rifle company behind us. But I had no idea, I never dreamed, that, uh, that the nature of the terrain was such that if they came up my level, level of where my machine guns were, and if they fired my troops and the bullets went through, they would hit anybody right behind me. So that meant that both rifle companies were going to get hit without being able to shoot because they'd have to shoot through my, my platoon. And they didn't. Not one bullet came from my our lines. So the first wave came up, uh, just uh, literally hundreds, I guess, I don't know. Um, but anyhow, they, everybody was screaming and hollering and, and battle erupted, and they were right on top of us when they hit that line. And all my machine guns opened up, and uh, uh, everything happened so fast that it uh, took me 15 years. I never mentioned anything. To this day, nobody has ever interviewed me or asked me what I did to get be awarded a Congressional Medal of Honor because I had about 200 eyewitnesses back there that were popping their heads up over the hill watching this whole thing all night long. It developed into a hand-to-hand -hand battle all night long. And the most weird thing any man, I couldn't describe it. There's no way in the world I, could I describe it. It's just screaming and hollering and people losing. Uh, Cashman got his head blown off and I stand right next to, uh, even as dark as it is with all the flashes and everything going on, you could you could see, you could pick out people. And when I saw this huge Japanese run a bayonet through Little Leapheart, he was the smallest man in my platoon, he actually impaled him, ran his bayonet through Little Leapheart, and threw him over his head, uh, right over his head. I saw this with my own eyes. And uh, uh, hadn't I been to China, I, mean, I don't know how it reacted. So anyhow, but uh, I was able to use my 45 and, and uh, uh, that was the end of that charge with that fella. And uh, being an old football player, I call myself an old football player, I was always engaged in all sports, uh, any kind, from hockey to baseball to football and whatever. And uh, for some reason, I, I thought about this for years. And that's why for 15 years I didn't talk, want to talk about anything there. But uh, after seeing this, um, my uh, 45 was empty and I just dropped it. And I always carried my K-bar, that's the knife that every Marine carries. 
right in my, my belt, my pistol belt, just like that. And for some reason or other, uh, I felt like I was back on the football field and going around right in because I swung around just as quickly as I could, stiff arm like that, I, like I was going to stiff arm something, somebody, and a fellow ran and he's bayonet right through my hand. And uh, it was headed for my throat. I didn't know at the time, but I'm sure that's what he was doing. And it threw him off balance. And the only thing I could do is pull out my K-bar, and uh, God let me stay on my feet long enough to go with him. And uh, I left my K-bar right here in his neck someplace. So anyhow, I picked up a weapon that were lying around. Gaston was fighting in the light. I could see uh, he was one of my men. There was a Japanese officer over him with a sword. And uh, Gaston, I guess, ran, couldn't load the machine gun uh, fast enough or something. Mind you, these guys came right in over us and uh, stepping on us and walking all over us. And we didn't know where they were. We were running in, into one another. And I never dreamed I'd ever see that in my lifetime, but it did happen like that. And uh, I ran back and forth across the line. And uh, uh, when I came to lock Charlie Locke's gun, just as I reached him, I was running back and forth and uh, to make sure that everybody was, had ammunition and was still fighting. And uh, guys were getting hit, and as soon as a guy got hit, somebody pulled him off, or one of these riflemen came up, fortunately, and pulled him back over the hill and took him away. And uh, just as I got to lock, I just got right behind his gun and he got up. I, whether he was thinking that uh, I was a Japanese or something, I don't know. But anyhow, he got a full burst and right through here and right down his right side. And uh, I held on to him. I just hugged him like I put my arms around him. And I was so covered with blood that uh, my hands during the night were just uh, sticky. Well, anyhow, he just, uh, uh, Lock, that's the way Locke died. So I had, I yelled for somebody to get a hold of Locke, I said, and pull him off the line. Somebody take over this gun or something. I don't know what I screamed, but I was just screaming to him. And meanwhile, I was running back and forth. And this hand-to-hand -hand battle went on uh, for all night long. And uh, at one point, I'd known that a lot of Japanese had left the United States, had gone through military colleges or just harbored in different places like that and came back to, came back to uh, Japan and were officers. Now this was part of the Sendai Division and Colonel Oka's 38th uh, Infantry uh, Regiment. So there were between 2,500 and 3,000 Japanese attacking my 33 men. And uh, I learned all this from Major Conley and intelligence officers. They all told me all these things. So anyhow, uh, as I ran back and forth, uh, I didn't realize it until a long time later that uh, maybe when I was with Charlie, but uh, a bullet went through my pistol belt and went through my left side, I guess through the fleshy part of it, and out. And uh, uh, it was so insignificant uh, when I stopped and thought about Cashman. Uh, went by him, and just as I just about got to him, a grenade exploded as it reached his neck and his head went off, just blew his head right off. So that was one another reason why I, I couldn't tell anybody. I said, I can't describe it. And meanwhile, I heard this sound, an American voice, sound like American voice, in the Japanese. Here they are, wave after wave, coming up, you know, uh, bayonets with machine, light machine guns behind them, and they'd fire right through them. They were firing right through my men, across this little field, and they were having casualties in G Company now and Fox Company. Uh, and with all this shooting, you know, grenades going off, uh, 60 millimeter mortar rounds that Captain Ditto was firing right over my head and landing right down there in that kunai grass in front of me because he didn't want to hit me. He knew where I was and he'd been up to the line so he knew exactly what to do. And I heard this voice says, blood for the emperor, blood for the emperor just uh, over all the shooting and everything else. And boy, I went through one ear and I, uh, so, so distinct. And lo and behold, uh, one of my sergeants, uh, Richard E. Stansbury, who is still alive, I think he got three Purple Hearts that night. But anyhow, he jumped up and he screamed out, blood for Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt. You know, blood for Eleanor Roosevelt. He's a tough guy, 220 pounder, you know, make a good football player. 
probably the most important thing to me in this whole battle was that uh, I, when I looked around and they told me later on that they could see this uh, George company now is there alone. And they said the only, they could only see one person running back and forth and he didn't know who it was. And at one point he took one of the guns and turned it around and he fired it toward our lines, but he fired it where Fox Company had been. There's no Marine back there now because they're all gone. But there were Japanese that broke through the line and they were lying down waiting for the rest of them to come with fixed bayonets and then they were going to charge down the hill because it was an easy shot down to the river, down to the beach road, and then right into the airport and here their fleet was sailing back and forth. So they would have isolated all the 1st Marine Division scattered out on this perimeter and it would recapture the airfield. But at that point, uh, it was just getting light, and I noticed my left flank gun uh, sitting over there, and all the guns are pointing this way, down the hill, you see, like that. And I, went on, I was on the right flank. So when I was at the right flank, I screamed back as loud as I could. I, I couldn't see any other Japanese there. Everybody was lying around. Somebody told me years and years later that about 920, some Navy guy came up laying around my machine guns. But anyhow, whether they were or not, I don't know, but I know they just pulled them down into the trees as, right after daylight. But uh, as I ran back and forth, and I, and I saw this one gun over there, and I thought, I've got to go over and get that gun and use it, because I figured that was in the best position to uh, stop if there were any more down there. So I ran back, and just as I got over there, a Japanese came up somehow through that cliff, up that cliff with a light machine gun, and he plunked that thing down about 12, 13 feet to my left where my machine gun was. My machine gun is facing straight ahead and I ran over, I jumped behind that machine gun and uh, lo and behold, this guy's over here to the left, his, his uh, machine gun was aimed at the left side of my left ear as a matter of fact. And I, I don't know, only, only God could have figured this one out for me because as a machine gunner, the first thing you do is turn your weapon toward the enemy immediately. Even though it's not loaded, you turn it to, toward him. Well, uh, my heart, I guess, was in my mouth for a minute. But I looked at the, I felt the gun and uh, uh, no belt in it. So I reached under the gun and picked up as fast as I could, inserted, I lifted the cover of the machine gun. You lift the cover like that, insert a 250 brown belt, 250 bullets, into the side of the gun, clamp it down like that, and that locks it in. The belt holding pole holds it in. Now, you're, meanwhile, you're sitting on your rear end, and you have to work the bolt twice, you see, to get it through, get it locked in, and then it gets into the gun itself, and it's, you got to reach forward for the second pull, pull it back, and that round will go into the barrel, and then all you have to do is put your finger on a trigger. Well, uh, only God could have done this for me. When I reached back, I was, when I was in a forward position, this guy was probably so excited, he started, pulled his trigger, and I was working like lightning. I just went back and forth so fast, but when I got in a backward position, I could not go forward for that necessary second pull to load it. Meanwhile, the gun's still facing down here, you see, away from this Japanese. And he had opened up on me, and I was just straining, just straining with all, all my strength to get forward. And I felt a warmth between my chin and my Adam's apple. And I, uh, I thought about this for days and days. I said, I'll never tell this to anybody. This is between you and me, Lord. And, and suddenly I went over the gun and had it unclamped, and I swung it around. And one burst, and the guy was gone because he'd already fired his 30 rounds. I knew he had 30 rounds because he had a banana type uh, uh, magazine on it. So with that over with, uh, I already screamed at these guys in George Company. When they saw me disappear over the hill, I was going to charge down this hill. I don't know what possessed me to do say that or holler, but guys told me later on, years later, that survived that battle and said that uh, they heard uh, Sergeant Page screaming for everybody to fix bayonets, and when he goes over the hill, we're supposed to follow him. Well, when they wrote my citation, that's what they did. They said I was leading a bayonet charge. So anyhow, when they saw me disappear, they're about 80 yards behind me or so. So I went unclamped. Before that, I'd taken all the ammo I had underneath the gun and swung, slung it around my shoulders like that. I had uh, a full belt now, just about a full belt. And uh, right before that, right before that, 
uh, before I got there, uh, neglected to mention this, I realized that the Japanese had broken through through my lines. I started to mention this, I've gone so fast. But they were lying on top of the hill behind me where Fox Company had been, looking down toward uh, uh, Connolly. And uh, his words came to me so clear, Mitch, there's nothing between you and I, but there'll be Japanese running through here. And I'm banking on you to hold the line. And so I swung a gun around, and I just swiveled it and fired, uh, fired that other gun, the gun that uh, uh, G Company had brought up to me. And I can't remember the fellow's name. One was Totman. Anyhow, I took their gun, and I used a whole belt, 250 rounds, and I sprayed just to the right of George Company because I knew that's where the Japanese were. And why George Company wasn't shooting at them, I guess maybe they couldn't see, it was still dark. And this is not even, just about the first light of day. And it's still pretty dark. You know, the darkest time of night is right before dawn. And so anyhow, uh, I sprayed that whole place. And when I got over to that gun and got behind it, and this guy shooting at me, missed me. And I uh, decided, well, I want to pick up this gun unclamped it from a 51-pound tripod, placed it in my arms, had it loaded, and I started down the hill and I yelled back, all right, all you riflemen, follow me. So I went down the hill and I'm bouncing like this. And uh, up out of the kunai grass, uh, about 18 or 19 Japanese came up and one of them was an officer and he had a revolver in his hand. Now he must have been maybe 35 yards, 40 yards from me at the point. And he was shooting at me but uh, I was bouncing and I was shooting down the hill and I had to clear off all this. These were probably part of his uh, sentries. So they all went down so fast and just fell in the grass with one burst because I had, a, I had good machine guns that fired fast, 1,300 rounds a minute. When I started down that hill, this fellow was shooting at me with his revolver. He hit my helmet twice. I didn't know this until later on when the guy wanted my helmet as a souvenir, but he didn't hit me. So he threw his, threw his revolver down, and I was right on top of him, maybe six feet away, and that's when I pulled the trigger, with my left hand like this, holding the gun like that. And I, he got the same thing that Locke got. For some reason or other, as I bounced, the bullets went right through the left side of his head and right down his body, down through his legs. And he was just drawing, at that point, he was drawing his samurai sword out. And he got it out about uh, a foot and I hit the sword as the bullets came down because, mind you, I'm bouncing, still bouncing and running, and bullets are just going left and right. And it hit the hilt and hit the scabbard, which was a metal scabbard. So, and I looked around and it was quiet as anything. It was like being in a morgue or something. And I just figured, well, the battle's all over. And I turned around and here comes my uh, batch of uh, bayonet charging Marines. And to me, that was the most beautiful sight I ever saw in my lifetime. I was screaming, these are just kids. And they were whooping it up and coming down the hill with fixed bayonets. And uh, I was so proud of them, so I went back up the hill. And this is a thing that uh, for years and years, one of the reasons why for 15 years I wouldn't tell anybody anything. Now, I went back up the hill. I put the machine gun back on a 51-pound tripod, just like I'd taken it off. And I went over to this dead Japanese machine gunner. And uh, uh, nobody's there yet. The, the bayonet guys are still down there looking at these guys and getting souvenirs, I guess. I don't know what they were doing, but everybody was dead around there. Everybody that you could see, down the kunai field to the edge of the jungle and everywhere. And the only people alive were the Marines that came over. And uh, uh, I took the, his machine gun out of his arm and uh, I pulled, went down the hill a little bit and uh, pulled him by the legs and he slid all the way down into the, into the jungle. And I lied, I decided, well, my machine gun is sitting there now, facing downhill and uh, down towards where I ran down the hill. And I tried, to, I tried to picture myself sitting behind that machine gun. And I got behind his light machine gun and I aimed it at that point and I knew that he was zeroed in on my left ear. Now, why didn't I immediately turn around to their left and face him first? Had I done this, those bullets that were whizzing by, you know, left and right, he, it was, his was vibrating too. And they weren't just accurate, even though he was that close. So I figured, well, 
he'd have had me so cold between shoulder and shoulder because I'd been facing him and I still hadn't uh, fired, a, uh, fired a bullet yet. So just one burst and uh, that was the end of him. But when I got, when this was over with, I went over and um, mind you, my hands were just uh, sticky from um, Locke's blood, I guess, and dirt reaching for uh, uh, ammunition underneath the gun. And uh, both hands were sticky with blood and, and dirt. And I reached, I finally found my pack. I knew where it was in this left side near Gaston's place. So I rolled this guy over and I took my pack. I put my feet down in the foxhole and dumped this pack out. And uh, 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 that was something that I, I swore then that I'd never ever reveal this to anybody ever in the rest of my lifetime. But my pack, all the contents fell out. And when we were in British Samoa, before we went to Guadalcanal, a Navy chaplain came around and gave every man in my platoon a little testament, New Testament. And you know, uh, for some reason or other, just like somebody had taken my hand and reached down, and that's the first thing that came in my hand was this little New Testament. But when I opened that up, uh, I thought, later on, I thought about it for years. I, I said, I must have cracked up, I must have been nuts or something, because the letters seem to be about an inch high. You see, about an inch high. And you know how tiny the printing is in that little New Testament. And it said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And uh, I remembered the one thing that caught me right there at that point. Providentially, it opened to that. Because when I left home in 1936, when my mother packed that bag, the sandwiches and apples I'd picked in the backyard, and a flat cake with icing on it, She'd cut it all up because I was going to walk 200 miles and she wanted me to have something to eat all the way. I'd be sleeping on the ground. And her parting words to me were, Son, all I want you to do is trust in God. Don't try to figure out everything by yourself and God will show you the way. Well, uh, I was commissioned on 19th uh, December 1942 on Guadalcanal as a battlefield commission, second lieutenant. So as the general put the medal around my neck, General A. A. Vandergrift, Alexander Vandergrift, in a parade at Mount Martha, uh, about 40 miles east of Melbourne, Australia, he put the medal around my neck and he's talking into my ear and he says, son, you're the first enlisted man in my division to be awarded this high medal. And he pinned it on me and he stepped back and he says, and I know that you were in China, so we'll need some more combat out of you and besides I made you a lieutenant. So uh, we shook hands and he had me stand over and wait for the next person to get decorated. But um, I took the medal, First Liberty. I got on a train at Frankfurt, uh, which was east of Melbourne, Australia, and went into town. I was trying to find a uh, post office, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure, but anyhow, I saw a liquor store. I saw all these little boxes of different things, cigars and things. I said, I'm going to run in and see if I can find a box. And uh, uh, well, I did. I found a box in there and had the uh, owner help me package it. We put my Medal of Honor in there, the box and all, in this little box. It wrapped it all up and sealed it. He told me where the post office was, and I just uh, got postage and mailed it home to my parents and forgot all about it and went on to New Guinea. And that was the end of that series. Well, the funniest thing, Marilyn, I think, still has, my wife Marilyn still has a copy of the story. But two years later, I'd, I'd already gone to New Guinea and was in the first wave at Cape Gloucester in New Britain Island, and was in a place called Pavubu in the Russell Islands, when somebody got a little article from a newspaper that says there are two Medal of Honor men that haven't been home yet to see the President of the United States to be awarded their Medal of Honor. And one is General MacArthur, and the other one is a, a Marine named Mitchell Page. Does anybody know where he is? <laughs> so when I got home, my congressman took me in for a real quick visit with, Gen with the President Roosevelt, and for the second time, I had this, this medal, the same medal that was mailed in a box. No insurance, no nothing. I just, it got home safely to my parents.